Welcome everyone and good afternoon. My name is Camilla Fox and I'm the founder and executive director of Project Coyote and we're thrilled to have our fourth uh, joint webinar with the Rewilding Institute today. And um, as with our other webinars, we are recording today. So we will be adding that to our uh, website and also sending out a link um, in the next few days so you can share that around. And before we get started and I introduce our fabulous uh, guest today, Dr. Joanna Lambert, I'd like to introduce my co-host, John Davis with the Rewilding Institute. Thank you, Camille. Thanks again to Project Coyote for including the Rewilding Institute in these webinars. These are all going terrifically well and we're reaching hundreds, maybe even thousands of people with a, a crucial message of coexistence. And the Rewilding Institute is a strong advocate for protecting big wild places and linking them via wildways, but we also realize that wildlife corridors are necessary but not sufficient. We also have to have coexistence with our fellow wild creatures. So uh, we, we consider ourselves close partners with Project Coyote, and you can follow us at rewilding.org. Thank you. Thank you, John. And we will be uh, taking questions. We're going to hold those until the end. So as with our other webinars, if you have a question during the um, webinar, you can put that into the chat. And then uh, as time allows at the end, probably around 15 minutes, um, John and I will toggle between each other and take questions. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Joanna Lambert. Um, Joanna is a professor in the program in environmental studies, as well as faculty in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and the Center for Microbial Exploration at the University of Colorado Boulder. She also serves as advisor to the United Nations Environmental Program and the IUC, IUCN Special Survival Commission. Species Survival Commission. She was voted Oregon's Emerald Professor of the Year, held a Villas Prof Professorship Award at UW-Madison, and is an elected fellow of both the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Linnaean Society of London. In addition to her ongoing research of rainforest ecology in Africa, Joanna also investigates carnivore nutrition and resilience at sites throughout the Rocky Mountain West, including Yellowstone National Park and the greater Denver area. Her most recent research addresses the rapid evolution of coyotes to urbanized landscapes. We are thrilled to have Joanna join our science advisory board and grateful for her giving her time and passion to Project Coyote's mission. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Joanna. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you, John. It is my absolute pleasure to be here and I am the biggest fan you could possibly imagine for both Project Coyote. I think I am Camilla's biggest fan, longest standing fan, and also the Rewilding Institute. Both of you are doing fabulous work uh, transforming policy and attitudes across, across the U.S. and it's just my great pleasure to be here. And thank you all. I don't see anybody um, and it feels so anonymous and uh, Camilla just said a, a number of nice things about me, but mostly what I feel like is is someone that just sits in a chair and stares at computers all day since we've been through this very strange time of the pandemic. But again, thank you all for taking this hour out of your day to be here. It's, it's really my great pleasure. So I am going to share my screen right now and uh, sort of make this happen. Let's see. And Kalei, can I get a thumbs up if you can see everything okay? Yes, excellent. Um, so yeah, today I am going to be addressing a number of topics, fear, wild things, and coexisting with predators. But before I go there, I always like to start my talks with the acknowledgements instead of the other way around with acknowledgements coming at the end when everybody's tired or sleepy or exhausted. Um, just because I, I have this firm belief that science and the education enterprise in general um, is a communicative and collaborative endeavor and absolutely nothing that I do as a scientist or as a researcher educator could be done alone. Uh, there are just too many people to thank here, but again, Project Coyote Rewilding Institute, numerous field technicians and project managers. I've had a number of uh, current, current and former students. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the work of a couple of those students, Emily Beam and Zach Schwartz. 
uh, numerous uh, colleagues with whom I've had the pleasure to work and have friendships. Uh, too many to mention, but I will be talking about the work of PJ Perry, Stuart Breck, Chris Schell, and Joel Berger today in some of our collaborations. Safe assumption that if you see a beautiful photograph, I did not take it. Um, so many thanks to the beautiful photographers out there, especially Ellen Uhr, Jamie Heimbuck, uh, Ghost Bear Photography, and Ronan Donovan at Nat Geo, and of course, Google Images, and all of my various uh, funding agencies. So as sort of hinted by the title, Today, what I'm going to be attempting to do is integrate three very broad areas of research and literature on um, evolutionary history of our own ancestral line, the neurology of fear, and then coexisting with predators. But before I go there, I thought um, I'd give you a bit of background. I am, uh, I'm not sure if Camilla mentioned, um, I'm actually the newest advisor on uh, the Project Coyote website. So many of you might not know who I am. Uh, so I want to give a bit of background into myself and then also provide some context for the for the remainder of the course. And it may, uh, you know, we just heard these things about what I'm doing today as a researcher, scientist, educator, but uh, long before that, um, I was that idiot kid who was insane about animals. Uh, animals were my entire world. And I went through a several month period of my life absolutely convinced after watching numerous bird species that if I just tried hard enough and if I just had the right kind of wings, I could actually fly. And I, I just wish I could invoke the feeling that I had when I was young of just that pure conviction. Uh, it did take a while. I eventually got over it. And luckily for you all today, um, I gained a little experience and I gained a, a little insight into the world. And today I call myself an integrative ecologist. An integrative ecologist and field biologist who, in short, has been around long enough to have seen extraordinary change and loss to the natural world, to Mother Earth, which has led me to being the kind of scientist that I am today, which is an activist scientist and a conservation practitioner. So what do I mean by integrative? Integrative means that essentially I am interested in how the things on the inside of an animal scale up Right? How do things like uh, physiology, like genetics at the individual level, scale up to broader processes and patterns, broader processes and patterns at the population level, at the community level, and even at the ecosystem uh, sort of level of, of ecology. As an example of what I'm talking about for many, many years in this work is uh, to varying degrees still ongoing in equatorial Africa, I have been looking at how patterns of digestive physiology, guts essentially, influence the feeding decisions of, in this case, uh, chimpanzees and their choice of various fruit species, how that impacts what happens to the seeds of those fruits, which in turn influences may, uh, the recruitment and the germination of those seeds all the way up to what we could consider kind of an ecosystem or landscape level process of the regeneration of, of forests. So I'm an integrative ecologist. Oops, sorry, something just happened with my computer. Hang on. Integrative ecologist, for some reason, my thing won't there we go. Um, and as I mentioned, a animal lover, an animal lover throughout, uh, hang on a sec, throughout my life. Um, and this spans not only uh, wild mammals and, and birds, but also, uh, but also my own beloved pets. 
I started with my first field work. Uh, this was on eastern cottontail rabbits and uh, various North American rodents in 1984, and then really working in equatorial Africa over the past few decades, mostly with primates. And now, in addition to my work in Africa, working in North America, primarily in the Western states, and mostly with carnivores, and especially coyotes. So that's kind of a timeline that can give you some insight into the fact that I am absolutely old enough and I feel like I've had enough field experience um, to have observed extraordinary change on planet Earth. And there are innumerable reasons for this extraordinary change. This could be a class unto itself, but in short, boiling down to a, a few basic processes that we're all very, very, very poignantly aware of. And that is that as human population is increasing around the planet and decreasing population, that this is this sort of interaction that is resulting in more and more human wildlife conflict, not just in our backyards, not just in our own towns and cities, but around the world. And as, uh, you know, as, as I will show some pictures of in a minute, what I also want to talk about today in particular is that as these, as these patterns are taking place, humans are also learning, or excuse me, losing knowledge about how to be around animals. And in, in many ways, this is being shaped by fear, and I'm going to be going there later on. The other thing that's going on is that some animal species, certainly not all, but some animal species are habituating to the presence of humans. And in fact, entering into habitats that where they weren't previously found. I will be talking about this as well in a discussion of boldness in various wild species. So at, to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about, these are a couple of photographs from the region where I work. Uh, in equatorial Africa, in western Uganda, a couple of my study species, chimpanzees and, and baboons. And this would have been a typical scene, say, 25 to 30 years ago in that part of the country. Today, increasingly, what we see as habitat has shrunk, human populations exploded almost 241% in the region of uh, that in that region of the world. Scenes like the following are increasingly common. Kind of these uh, animals entering into habitat, uh, not having really any recourse other than entering into human dominated landscapes and the inevitable kind of conflict. Similar situations here, of course, and many of you out there I know are very, very aware of this. Scenes in North America of, of predators like black bear and coyote increasingly getting into trouble in these human dominated landscapes and ultimately in many cases arising in, in a lot of conflict. So what do we do about this? This is, we know we have this very, we've got a great awareness of this ever increasing human populations. And the question is, how do we coexist? We can't just kill everything in our backyards. We can't just kill everything in our various landscapes, right? But the fact is, is that we're losing habitat and humans are increasing in their distribution. And we've got to figure this out. This is not a trivial question especially with predators. And I've got a couple of scenes here. This is of a mountain lion that was uh, photographed in Boulder, where I live, Boulder, Colorado, and then, of course, a, a Bengal tiger in the bottom image. And I would suggest that predators might represent what we would consider a special case. And I'm going to be fleshing out much of this in the remainder of the talk. First of all, in some cases, not all, certainly not all, but in some cases, there are more of them. And these predators, like coyotes, like black bear, are in areas where we are not accustomed to seeing them. This is for a number of reasons. In some cases, it's because of local, state, or federal protections. For example, in the case of grizzly bear, uh, in the case of gray wolves, uh, recolonization of areas and reintroduction, such as what has been proposed here in Colorado. 
This other piece of it, though, as well, some of these species are exhibiting what we could call the opposite of fear, and that is bold behavior. The other part of it, though, that is really germane, I think, is that the special case of predators is that they require special knowledge that we have lost. Okay, it's one thing to have a cedar waxwing come to your bird feeder in the backyard or uh, some tree squirrel, but if you have a grizzly coming into your backyard, a coyote or a mountain lion, this requires a whole different set of, of tools and knowledge, and we have in many ways lost this. The other part, of course, that we're all very aware of is that predators are scary. We should be scared. They can and, and sometimes do attack humans, pets, and livestock. This, this sets us up into this position of, in many cases, being afraid, which can then influence our inter interactions with predators. There are many things that influence our interactions with predators. Too much to get into today. Today, I'm just going to be talking about that piece of it that we could call fear. So with this in mind, with the background as to who I am and how I got here, a bit of context for this talk, I want to talk about human predators in deeper time and, excuse me, humans and predators in deeper time and in more recent time, and then how fear can shape our interactions with predators. I want to describe what fear is. I want to describe how we might overcome a fear response. And then I want to talk about this phenomenon of boldness, which we could consider the opposite of fear. So humans and predator, this, I want to start in deep time. And the reality is that hominins, meaning humans and our direct forebears, have coexisted with predators throughout our evolutionary history and before. So our species, Homo sapiens, we are a baby species. We've been around just for the blink of an eye in geological terms, 200,000 years. But throughout almost all of that 200,000 years, with the exception of the last, say, 100 years, we have coexisted and interacted with large-bodied predators. The previous hominin, Homo erectus, evolving around a million, or excuse me, two million years ago, dealt with a number of predators in their landscapes. And then, of course, even earlier, bipedal hominins, anywhere from eight to two million years. It's important to know that the predators of the so-called Pliopleistocene or Pliocene Pleistocene epochs of time through which most of our evolutionary history is, is found, um, there were many, many more of those predators, predators that have gone extinct. Uh, we, that very what we call species-rich predator guild in all regions of the planet where humans were found. The other part of it is that on average, they were much larger in body mass. And so here you see um, on the bottom slide, you've got a short-faced bear, uh, huge uh, bear species, a smilodon or a saber-toothed cat, very much larger even than, uh, than adult male tigers today. But somehow we survived. Right? And arguably, we are the most ecologically and evolutionarily successful species on the planet. And the question is, how did we do it? Right? I would suggest, and I'm going to be fleshing this out, that it is a function of a number of interacting variables that we still have within our toolbox. Habituating to the presence of, of predators in our landscapes learned behavior that is culturally transmitted, and also the knowledge to have various tools in the case of our ancestors for hunting and defense, in the case of our ancestors, also the use of dogs. We know from the paleontological and archeological record that wolf dogs or proto dogs have been around for over 32,000 years. And it has been suggested that in fact, humans worked cooperatively with these early dogs, proto dogs in their defense of, of habitat and resources. Things started to change though, 
about 11,000 years ago. The world changed in, in a shift, uh, kind of a um, kind of cultural, sociological, economic, ecological shift that we call the Neolithic Revolution, which fundamentally transformed human predator interactions for a number of reasons. One of which is that we shifted from a species that moved around that was mobile in their course of hunting and gathering, we settled down into what are called sedentary, into a sedentary lifestyle of settlements. We also started domesticating livestock, new potential prey for the predators in, in sharing that landscape. At the same time, this is when we see the first bump in the rise in the total number of humans on the planet. So this is something that has been now for the last 10 to 11,000 years sort of cascading everywhere that we go. And over subsequent millennia, what we've seen is a concerted and organized effort to remove predators, right? Such that, for example, and, and this is not just in uh, Western Europe, but I'm going to be using Western Europe as an example. We see the extinction of predators in the British Isles. Wolves were gone, depending on which island and which part of, of uh, Great Britain between 1166 and 1786. The Eurasian brown bear, our, their equivalent of our grizzly by about 1000 AD, and then the Eurasian lynx um, gone by about 400 AD. At the same time, we start seeing numerous narratives arising, human narratives, whether we want to call them fairy tales or myths or, or legends or storytelling that include predators. So you can imagine, right, after extirpating in much of uh, Western Europe, as I said, I'll be focusing on Western Europe um, simply because of the history of how this country was colonized. You can imagine as Western European colonize, co colonizers arrive to North America, how affronted and fearful and scared they were when they encountered species that they had only ever heard about in narratives such as the Little Red Riding Hood, the Big Bad Wolf. There was a lot of historical and cultural inertia behind this, regardless of whether individuals had or had not seen a wolf or a brown bear in, real, in person. They were scary. And as uh, can be read in, in a number of environmental history books, they were quite simply an affront to manifest destiny, an affront to the so-called American way of life. As predators started taking livestock, uh, naive and easy to catch livestock after their native prey like bison had been, had been removed. And so this is a story that much, many of you know. We start to see throughout the 1800s, even the 1700s, 1800s, uh, into the 20th century resolutions at all levels, local, state, territorial, federal, to remove these affronts, these scary, th threatening species that were an affront to the American way of life, with bounties being offered that could actually result in a decent wage for many individuals, upwards of five bucks for a mountain lion pelt, which was a lot of money in the, in the 19th century. So what we have then is what I called or what we can think of as a perfect storm for conflict shaped by fear. We've got large body predators gone from much of the United States, not all, but much of the United States by the early to mid 20th century. And with that, lost knowledge of how to be around those organisms, how to be, how to be accustomed to having them around in the same landscapes. And now what we have is that in some cases, as some species are either entering new habitat like coyotes or returning because of federal protection, such as the case of uh, uh, grizzly, we have predators coming back, which is both a wonderful story, but it sets us up for, as, as I indicated in those earlier photos, conflict based on fear. So I want to now turn to what this phenomenon of fear is. 
Um, there's been, I, I don't consider myself a biologist of fear. There has been a number of, of just beautiful um, uh, projects on fear. Many scholars have studied innumerable um, sort of aspects of fear. Um, they're too numerous to, to describe or to list here. I've got the names of a few of those research, I'd be, research who might be remiss not to mention. And for those of you in the audience who are interested in learning more about fear, I'd like to recommend a couple of just superb books. Um, one by Joel Berger, uh, The Better to Eat You With, Fear in the Animal World, in which he describes the evolutionary ecology uh, and, uh, of fear and what happens when you you put reintroduce predators back into landscapes where prey species have forgotten how to be around predators. And then a much more, a more recent book by Dan Bloomstein, 2020, The Nature of Fear. Uh, Dan has worked on many aspects of fear throughout his, throughout his career. And these are both just, just great, um, great books to read that I'd like to recommend. But fear, really, in order to get a sense of what fear is, we need to go to our brain. Our brain, which is both, um, the source of so much uh, innovation and potentially also the bane of our existence. Um, in our case, or in the case of this particular talk, what I want to emphasize is that this magnificent brain of ours, we've got the largest brain per, you know, relative to body mass of any species on the planet. Um, our magnificent brain provides both the source of fear and also solutions to that fear. So what do I mean by that? I've got some arrows here kind of pointing to general regions of the brain. I wanna talk about the source of fear, which we can think of as the emotional center of the brain, i.e. the limbic system, which is regulating any number of emotional responses, including fear. This is a very, ancient part of our brain, as I will talk about. We share this in common with all vertebrates, or at least part of this with all vertebrates. We've also, though, because we are homo sapien, because the, our brain is what gave us a competitive edge for all those hundreds of thousands of years, we also have the solution to that fear. In our neocortical uh, region of the brain, and especially the prefrontal of, of the frontal lobe of the forebrain that is essentially responsible for executive function and learning. So I wanna talk about these two aspects of the brain so that we can get some insight into what it means to be afraid. So the limbic system, I said it was ancient, it is. It's been around at least parts of it for at least 450 million years. We share aspects of our limbic system or of our fight or flight response with other organisms. This system sends signals to the body, including of course the, the adrenal gland, glands to prepare an individual for whether it should flee from a predator, fight that predator or freeze. And what you're looking at in these images, uh, you've got down at the um, bottom left, an image of a sailfish that's hunting a school of fish. Um, those fish are, their brains, elements of their brains are firing in the same way that the brain in this Thompson's gazelle is firing as it's being preyed on, chased by a, a large cat here which is the same aspects of our brain that fire when we're watching something that is really scary at the movie theater, when we used to go to movie theaters, if you remember. Um, but what, what is important here is that this is an ancient aspect to our emotional response, but importantly, aspects of the limbic system also store learned memories. It integrates emotional response with learning through a feature known as the hippocampus, which means that if you have been scared by something, 
the information that you learned while you were scared, the information that you learned from and that was coded by your limbic system has a great, has a hugely impactful uh, sort of in, in influence on your behavior. The neural pathways are particularly deep. So this is, this is really important, um, not only to humans, but to all mammals and other vertebrate species. And here in terms of this scaling up, what this suggests is that individual physiological response, and I've got this elk here with this kind of fired up uh, limbic um, aspect shown in red, that individual physiological response informed by past experience can impact individual decisions. In other words, do I kill that scary thing or do I avoid that scary thing? One thing we do know is that again, in human species and then in other non-human species, extreme fear can get coded in as post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And in a recent uh, work by Zanette and her colleagues, uh, 2019, it was demonstrated that predator-induced fear is the most common form of PTSD in wild animals. So this is something that we share with our mammalian brethren, and it even has been demonstrated in non-mammal species as well. This has really important consequences for, for the impact of um, fear and how it might scale up. And I mentioned at the beginning, I'm an integrative ecologist. I'm, think, I'm interested in, in what happens on the inside of an animal and how that scales up. Perhaps the most famous example, right, talked about and read about and studied over the past uh, couple of decades are the ecological effects that have been called a landscape of fear in Yellowstone National Park. I'm assuming many of you know this story. For those of you who don't, this, this landscape of fear with all of its cascading effects from the individual physiological response all the way up through landscape level processes was a consequence of what happens when you put predators back into a system where those predators have been gone for a while. In this case, gray wolves being reintroduced back into Yellowstone National Park in 1995 and 96. Elk who had not encountered in the past multiple generations encountered that particular apex predator fear responses that shape the ways and the areas in which they browsed or fed on vegetation, which, sent, which had consequences for patterns of vegetation growth along riparian regions of especially the northern part of the park, which then had consequences for those animal species relying on those different parts of, of the vegetation. With regards to fear and our fear of predators, I would suggest, and, and, and especially coming from this physiological perspective, that it has sociocultural effects that scale up as well. In other words, if you look down at the bottom right and you see that, that young girl, and she's got a fired up limbic system, and rightfully so because she has just been exposed to a wolf, right? It is, a, it is an ancient limbic response. Right? But this ancient limbic response can, it can take place regardless of whether that little girl has or has not seen a wolf in her, in her life. And where I'm going with that is that the stories of predators and how predators may attack humans, even though it's very rare, this is enough of a limbic response to have ultimately had these broader cultural effects so that we have numerous tales about how scary predators are, which can then influence patterns at an even broader sociocultural level, right? That th this inertia of fear can influence perspectives of wolves, whether or not those individuals have seen wolves. So that we see that this is from a wolf protest, 
um, in Washington where the wolf was likened to that of Saddam Hussein in the animal world. When really it's, it's a biological species that's just doing its thing in a landscape, right? So these are really important processes and that of scaling up of fear. And the question is, what do we do about it? Right? How do we overcome this? We can't walk around in a state of fear. Um, and the good news is that we do have the solutions, right? In the same brain that we have all this ancient fear responses, we have other parts of the brain involved in learning and executive function that can influence and shape our reaction to fearful things. In primates, we see this especially in the neocortical region of the brain, and then in humans, right, a primate species, especially in the prefrontal. So what am I, where am I going with this? We've been around for 200,000 plus years, right? We've had that brain for 200,000 plus years, and the strategies for coping with predators, hence, really haven't changed a whole lot. It relates to habituation, which I will define in a second, learning new things, and using tools, including dogs. Overcoming fear then, Hab habituating and learning. So what do I mean by habituation? Psychologists and behavioral biologists think of habituation as a diminished response to a novel stimulus. In other words, getting accustomed to the presence of something that wasn't previously there. Right? So that the fight or flight response over time diminishes. And here we've got a beautiful photograph uh, from the Urban Coyote Initiative demonstrating a dog and a human that have bumped into a coyote. Now you bump into a coyote enough times, you begin to get habituated. Learning is important in situations where habituation might not be possible, where bumping into things might result in a problematic encounter. In this case, acquiring new knowledge that is culturally transmissible is particularly important. In other words, learning tools. I'll talk about flagery in, in a minute, uh, a, a method by which to, to coexist with predators and livestock. Uh, ranch land. So habituating to preser. Let's talk a bit about habituating, the first part of that, the habituation part. And this is uh, work done by Julie Young and colleagues, including um, uh, Joel Berger, whom I've already mentioned. Um, and what in this particular study, this was work that was done in Idaho, in Montana, um, and then also in Washington. Uh, uh, working with communities, getting a sense of attitudes towards predators, including wolves, that have been uh, uh, recolonizing after the introduction. And what they found is that coexistence attitudes are more likely in, to occur in those communities that have had a longer history of having wolves around. And that less knowledge of wolves overall results in more resistance. And overall then the trend being that in areas without large body predator, predators or in recently colonized areas by predators can lead to misinformation, which is a major barrier to coexistence. So in other words, just being around, having those entities, having those predators around for longer through a, it simply influences habituation to their presence. Now it takes a bit more than just habituation as I'll talk about, um, but enough, in other work uh, on habituation, this is uh, work by one of my students, Zach Schwartz, whom you see at the top here. And Zach uh, here at CU Boulder um, conducted in-person interviews uh, with people living in Denver suburb res residents. And what he found is that 55% of the people that he interviewed confused boldness. So we know the bold, that coyotes are getting uh, more bold, meaning a lack of fear. That doesn't mean that they're aggressive. And what he found is that 55% of his respondents confused boldness in coyotes with aggression. 
and that overall 29% of, of his interviewees were fearful. But importantly, this ability to distinguish between boldness and aggression, and then this fearful state related to the level of experience of living with coyotes in the area. So people being habituated. So the other part of it, we've got habituation. I want to talk about the other part, which is the learning part, because in some cases, it, we need more than just being accustomed to having predators in our landscapes. And the wonderful thing is, is that we now have a, a diverse, what we could call toolkit of coexistence. This has uh, been studied by a number of scholars. I've got a few uh, down here at the bottom. Uh, dogs and other guard animals are particularly uh, in, important, particularly useful. And we know from that earlier discussion that they have been useful to humans for a very long time, over 30,000 years. If they're electronic, even if it's an electronic barking dog, as demonstrated by Syraki et al. in 2014, it can thwart incoming predators. How you graze your livestock, how you herd your livestock can be influential. Do you have your herds in, small, in smaller kind of more tightly knit groups or distributed over a landscape with just a lot of solitary animals? That can influence whether or not those animals get preyed on by predators living in the area. Hazing and scare devices in the form of light and sound and flattery, which is what you're seeing here in, in the top, these, uh, these ribbons, these, these kind of uh, light ribbons that can move in the wind can be scary to predators. They are best used in combination with other tools. Removing carcasses, we you know from a wonderful experience, um, uh, pattern or excuse me programs such as the Blackfoot Challenge uh, that just simply removing carcasses of dead animals and other attractants is 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 a way of thwarting predation. Range riders and other forms of human presence are really important. Gathering of stakeholders. People need to talk about their fears. They need to talk about what it means to have conflict what it means to coexist with species, right? This is a critical part of our toolkit. Uh, some great work by Becky Nemack at Colorado State University and other colleagues there at the, the Center for Human Carnival Coexistence has demonstrated the significance of purposeful meetings of stakeholders to discuss these, to, to discuss tools, to discuss learning, to dis discuss fear. I'm going to add compassion and empathy to this, something that may not get talked about as, as much as I talk about compassion and empathy. And the way that I want to talk about this is by saying that understanding these limbic responses that we call fear can lead to compassion and empathy. As I'll talk about, compassion and empathy are stimulated by other parts of the brain in the neocortex. This is our ability to be compassionate, to be empathetic, is yielded by this wondrous brain of ours as, as a human species. And I would ask or suggest that understanding fear can yield compassion and empathy both ways. So first of all, it allows us to understand when we see fear reactions in animals, right? All of the animals that we encounter experience fear in one way or another, and it gets played out in multiple ways. But importantly, I think, and this can nuance our conversations about living with predators, understanding fear can influence our empathy and compassion to those individuals who have been directly impacted by predation. Because the reality is, is that even though the impact, the likelihood of a livestock or a pet, even though the likelihood of that 
of, of a predation event is vanishingly small, the reality of it is that there are some ranchers and some areas that get hit over and over again so that we might have a situation where one particular rancher has been hit over and over again and has a very visceral, direct experience of what it means to have experienced a predation event in their backyard, right? So understanding this, I think, helps us to create a compassionate and empathetic engagement. And again, empathy and compassion, we know from fMRI and a lot of science, is stimulated in, in the region of this neocortex. We could call it the supermarginal gyrec, uh, gyrus of the neocortex. We don't need to go there. Importantly, what I think is important is that adding to our toolkit is that this deflates conflict with those who have been directly impacted predator, by predators, facilitating compassion communication amongst diverse stakeholders, because we all share it in common. Just a few words on boldness, and, and then I'll end up here. This is something that I am, and uh, a number of my colleagues and, and students have been thinking ab about and, and researching. I've seen bold animals in various settings around the world. And we can think of boldness as the opposite of fear, right? What happens when you're no longer scared, right? This is, as I've mentioned, occurring around the world where animals are entering human dominated landscapes. This can be disconcerting, if not downright scary, right? Um, and how this is taking place and why animals are getting bolder, we have more, way more questions than we have answers. How is this occurring? Is this because of genetics? Is it learning? Is it habituation? Is it some mix of all of it? Why would animals be coming into human um, excuse me, urbanized areas. In some cases, it's because there's no habitat left, but in some cases, it might mean because there's more foods or that they're escaping some kind of predation, which has been suggested for, uh, say, species like coyote. Regardless, we do know that this is resulting in conflict with humans. And here's another beautiful a uh, photograph um, by the Urban Coyote Initiative showing this beautiful uh, and bold coyote. Um, and this is something in particular that I've been thinking about and in investigating this, no, this phenomenon of bolder urban coyotes. We know from work by Breck and colleagues, by Chris Schell and colleagues, that there are very real demonstrable differences in the behavior of rural and urban coyotes and in the pups raised by mother coyotes who are habituated. Now, this is, again, I mentioned this is something that I've uh, and my colleagues have been thinking about work coming out of my lab. This is my student, Emily Beam, uh, who just defended her master's thesis on bold urban coyotes. About 10,000 hours of direct observation of Denver suburb coyotes, done non-invasively, mind you, uh, no radio callers. Um, what Emily found is that the coyotes in Denver suburbs have reached a, what she called the habituation threshold. In other words, anthropogenic stimuli no longer is, elicits a response on the part of those coyotes. Those are some pretty bold habituated animals. Opposite, this, this kind of opposite of fear, this boldness, I'm addressing a, along with multiple colleagues kind of listed there on the on below um, from an integrative approach. And my, I mentioned that I was interested in this kind of scaling up process. And what we are doing then is looking at how individual physiology and genetics scales up influencing behavior, which may then translate to populational differences in urban and rural coyotes. Right now we're sampling in Denver area and in Yellow Nas Yellowstone National Park with, an, with a research design that looks at what happens when coyotes are in areas with their uh, natural prey, or excuse me, predators such as wolves in, in Yellowstone versus human predators. What, what, 
how are, how are differences in natural food versus urban foods, how are these factors shaping boldness? And can we detect it physiologically and genetically? So with an image of this kind of scaling up, um, I, 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 I want to bring it back to this notion of the things on the inside of an animal might have consequences at higher orders of, of, of understanding. Looking at how natural prey like microteen rodents or um, our human foods such as Cheetos, uh, human hunters versus wolves, how that shapes or co-varies with gut microbiome, the genome of the animal, the endocrinology of the animal, overall gut-brain interactions, how is that feeding into the behavioral profiles of those animals, and are there detectable differences in these profiles across landscapes? So this is um, some of the work that I and my, and, um, my students and, and my amazing, awesome colleagues are working on. To sum up, a lot, of, a lot of work and a lot of disparate literatures here. I want to just say, just come back to where I started. We have lived with predators throughout history. This is part of our evolutionary history. It's part of our recent history. Only very, very recently have we lost the knowledge of how to do this. Some predators are returning, which for someone like me is a happy thing, right? Uh, either by recolonization or reintroductions or entering new landscapes. They are, or in some cases they are habituating. This is happening at a time when human populations are increasing and habitat is decreasing, which can arise in conflict. Human fear is not the only thing that influences conflict by no means, but it absolutely has an important influence on conflict. Human fear influences conflict with predators, but we literally have the brains to overcome this. Using knowledge, an extensive toolbox of coexistence, and compassion. So that's what I got, folks. Um, I thank you for your time. Again, uh, many thanks to the Rewilding Institute um, and Project Coyote. Um, again, I'm their biggest fans. And I think we have some time for questions. Camilla, should I quit out of the screen share? If yes, no? Sure. Yep. Yeah. You'll yep. be full screen. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to jump right in. Thank you, Joanna. That was a very fascinating presentation. I'm going to jump right into the questions. Um, so this is from your fellow Science Advisory Board member, Dave Parsons. And he, hey, asked, Hi, Dave. <laughs> he asked, do you consider the trophic cascade effect of returning wolves to be settled science? And is this effect possible in more human dominated landscapes? Oh, uh, that is what I would call not a softball. <laughs> um, so, so the question is, would we expect the trophic cascade to be happening in other areas? besides Yellowstone National Park. Am I sort of rephrasing that appropriately? Um, so, you know, a few, um, I would not call it settled science in the sense that it is not necessarily a neat and tidy story. Ecology is not neat and tidy. The, in, the reintroduction of wolves back into Yellowstone took place at a time of a change on planet Earth more generally. And what I mean by that is that uh, organisms now are existing in a, an era of massive climate change, more people, um, eroded habitat in many ways. And so when we talk about the impact of any single apex predator on a community of species or on both abiotic or biotic processes, it is really important that we include these other phenomena as well. In other words, things like climate change, what happens when certain uh, tree species are in decline, what happens when the insects that rely on those tree species that provide food for other predators in a system are no longer around. So there are other important uh, climate effects that are going on in Yellowstone. There are other important disease ecology effects uh, going on in Yellowstone. And I guess where I'm going with that is that yes, 
putting an apex predator back into a system has consequences for the prey species and the vegetation that those prey species consume, but that must be understood within a broader context of the other processes that are going on in that landscape. John, do you want to? Sure. Uh, an alert and then a question from Claire Perry. First, the alert. Uh, for anyone who can get to it, and maybe Claire, you could put up information about this. Apparently in Maine at four o'clock, that's in six minutes, there's a hearing about attempting to end predator killing contests, a very important effort. Wow. And then Claire's question, is it accurate to say that coyotes cannot, quote, overpopulate an area if they are not hunted or killed? Is it, um... Wow, these are good questions, you guys. I feel like I just spoke to a team of scientists um, and, and that I'm at a conference. Um, so yeah, um, you know, one, one thing that we do know is that in situations where coyotes are, are hunted by humans, um, there are all kinds of what we might call intrinsic biological responses. In other words, um, th those animals, those species have uh, ways of coping with the fact that they have just been hunted or, or preyed on. Uh, we get things like compensatory breeding, for example, or animals might start breeding when they're younger. Um, when coyotes are living in a system where, let's say, there isn't human hunting going on, um, it, it, coyote numbers are not just going to ever, ever, ever increase, right? All all species, all, all or animal species, that is, that, were, that need to find food, ultimately their population numbers are what we call limited. We call these limiting variables on the total population size of, of, this, of, a, of a particular species. So in other words, there isn't this ever increasing inexorable growth in populations of species because there's never, it's not necessarily the case that there's ever increasing available food for those other organisms. The other part that's really important to know is that Besides food and besides predation, the other factors that can influence the total size of a population are, is disease. And we know that when you get more and more individuals packed into an area, transmission of disease tends to erupt, right? And so these patterns of predation, of disease, of food availability, all are serving to kind of um, equilibrate, if you will, the total size of, of, of a population. So populations don't, with the exception of humans, populations of other species do not continue to rise and rise and rise. There are checks on those, on those population numbers. Good question. Thank you, Joanna. Okay, I'm gonna um, actually just clarify, Claire Perry uh, clarified this and I was going to clarify it too. The hearing, on the killing contest issue in Maine was yesterday, um, and today momentarily is a hearing on trapping, and oh. specifically coyote trapping. So there's a lot underway in Maine, and um, we're active in that. And thank you, Claire, for uh, clarifying that. Okay, so this is a question from uh, uh, Bob Bob Schmidt. Hi, Bob. <laughs> nice to see your name here. Um, he asked for most of our two plus million year history. I suspect we were prey for these predators. Might this history have resulted in a genetic imprint that affects current attitudes towards large predators? That's an awesome question. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and in fact, um, I really, really struggled to keep this talk uh, within the 45 minutes I was allotted, and I believe I even went over a couple of minutes. But um, I did have a number of, of slides talking about the ecological relationships between predators and prey in our evolutionary history. And absolutely humans and our direct ancestors, direct ancestors, Homo erectus, you know, various Australopithecine species, we were in this interesting and still are in this very interesting situation of serving as both predators and very good predators because we're armed, right? Uh, both predators and prey species. Lots and lots of, of paleontological evidence that we uh, were preyed on by some of these, um, um, you know, predators, these, these large body predators. There's some very, very striking, uh, for example, uh, endocasts of skulls of hominids with, uh, with um, you know, canines, punctures in the actual skull. So, you know, I, I would say that, yes, you know, that, that fear, I, 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 
I hesitate to use the word genetic because that sounds so sort of black and white, like that there's nothing we can do about it sort of thing. I would say that it absolutely has influenced um, our relationships with predators in the way that I was talking about, and that is with that limbic response. Now, some folks, um, there's a really cool literature, and I would uh, urge you to look at this. There's been some really nice stuff done on the evolution, the evolution of our fear of snakes. Um, there's been some really cool neuroscience on this uh, reaction that we all get that, I, that maybe some of you, I do this all the time when I see a stick that even a snake like, regardless of whether my neocortex knows that that's a stick, when I first see it, I jump. And there have been some, there's been some suggestion that there is particular neural wiring for, and not just all snakes, but vipers in, in particular, viperidae or the, um, the snakes that are most likely to kill us. So I would say um, that it's not that we have the gene for being scared of predators, it's that we have the neural wiring overall for having a fight or flight response um, to predators. And I do want to note also the work of Jared Diamond, who has suggested that, in fact, uh, many, of the, for many of the species that we have tried to domesticate over the, over the years, the ones that haven't worked particularly well, like zebra, are those species that were in East Africa that were hunted by us. And so it looks like the species that are more likely to be domesticated are those species that haven't had a long evolutionary history of being killed by us. And so, you know, there, there's something to your question for sure. Um, although I, I, again, I wouldn't want to boil it down to just like having the gene to be scared of X thing. Question from Philanor Howard. What is the experience of reversing boldness of predators that are now habituated to urban or su suburban areas? Yeah, that's an awesome question, really relevant. There was a really nice paper that was just put out last year, again, uh, by Julie Young and colleagues that demonstrated the importance of hazing. It is not, it's demonstrable and demonstrably impacting, right? And that um, but that the experience of an individual coyote or an, in, an individually bold animal um, is, is, is shapes how much hazing has to occur, right? So if, for example, a coyote, it is particularly difficult to um, remove that boldness or, or in other words, instill, reinstill fear into an animal if they have been hand fed in particular. So hand, all of us, I'm sure this is a, you guys are an amazing audience. I'm sure we all, you all know this already that hand feeding in particular um, is, is just setting up that animal for, you know, for problems, for, for conflict. But we do know that, that hazing can work and it's hard, right? Like if, you know, here where I live in Lyons, Colorado, there are black bear and coyote and, all, and I've seen mountain lion, I've seen all kinds of, of uh, predators in this area. And as an animal lover, the first thing I want to do is like get closer because I want to see it, right? But it, that, is not, that is not the thing to do in, in human dominated landscapes. Hazing, hazing works, as do other simple mechanisms like bear proof, you know, bear proof trash cans. Uh, I don't even have bird seed um, where I live. As much as I love birds, I, I, I don't even feed wild animals that way. So I think we have time just for one more question. Um, we have so many good questions and I'm really sorry they're pouring in that we don't have more time. We'll have to examine that time frame. Um, okay, so <clears throat> Anthony asks, how is coexistence going with wolves in the West? Progress, question mark. Are human hunters more accepting than say 20 years ago concerning wolves and coyotes and apex carnivores? Wow. Um. <laughs> Anus lupus. Um, That's all I think about these days. Uh, <clears throat> um, there is some extreme conflict going on. I, I don't want to mince the words on this. There is extreme conflict going on in Oregon. There's extreme conflict going on in Washington. Those are the regions. This is, it's like for all intents and purposes, the diaspora or the, uh, the continual kind of recolonization of areas that used to be um, inhabited by wolves, but then up until recently weren't. 
Um, but as that population of wolves in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem disperses out and recolonizes new areas, like in parts of California, Washington, and Oregon, ranchers and individuals, especially in the eastern portions of the state, there is, it is as hot and as volatile as you can imagine. I do want to make the important point that a hunter is not a hunter is not a hunter. There are, and, and a rancher is not a rancher is not a rancher. There is a lot of important variants of attitudes within a group towards having land, uh, towards having predators in a landscape. I will, um, and, and you know, some of, some of my colleagues are, are ardent hunters and also ardently believe and argue that we should have uh, apex predators in the landscape, for example, and likewise with, with rancher co friends and colleagues of mine. The, in the case of Oregon, Washington, and that part of the kind of inner uh, Pacific Northwest, this is an example of those are more recently, you know, arriving wolves to those areas, right? So this is when I talked about that sort of habituation, and I'm not minimizing, I, that's why I, I argue fully that we need to have an understanding, you know, compassion and empathy here is, uh, is going to we, is, is critical to making our way through these critical conversations. Um, but, you know, a lot of, of, of what is occurring in those parts of the West is a result of the fact that those are recent arrivals, right? And that in those areas like that, um, that work that uh, Breck and Young have done um, and, and others that in areas where there have been animals such as grizzly and wolves around for longer, that volatile, hot conversation tends to be somewhat deflated. And again, this is not to minimize like the impact on individual ranchers, which is a real thing, um, but it's, it's I, I, I would be reluctant to say that it's all easy or it's all solved. It's not, this is an ongoing process as wolves enter into new areas. We have uh, a, a very, robust conversation going on here in Colorado about exactly all of those issues. Thank you, Joanna. Yes, and just along those notes, um, for anyone who's not on our e-teams, I encourage you to sign up. We're deeply involved in these issues of what it means to coexist with predators in rural areas and urban areas. Um, we have a coyote-friendly community program that's focused on really um, helping uh, urban populaces, cities, counties, with trying to teach coexistence. Um, and then our Ranching with Wildlife program, we also work with a lot of uh, rural communities around this issue. Um, and also with Rewilding Institute, I know, you know, rewilding with large carnivores, that's part of the challenge here. So we're all uh, very deeply involved in these issues, encourage you to get engaged, sign up for our E-teams if you're not. And I'm sorry that we don't have time to answer all these um, phenomenal questions, but I know Joanna has kindly offered to answer some of them and we'll be sending out a follow-up email to everyone and then posting on our website. So thank you all for joining and um, thank you, John and Jack and Kaylee for helping make this happen and uh, wishing you all a fabulous afternoon. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you and thank you for all you do. Absolutely. Thanks, Joanna. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. <laughs>